Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. I'm Jenna Hamid, the Programs Manager at the Center for Book Arts. In case you guys don't know, the Center for Book Arts explores the contemporary and traditional artistic practices related to the book as an art object. Our space is located in the heart of Manhattan on 27th Street in Broadway. We usually host classes, lectures, poetry readings, exhibitions, and studio spaces for artists to work. While the center has been closed for the past two months, we've moved much of our programming online, which includes courses in the book arts, artist talks, and now poetry readings. The Broadside Reading Series usually includes a component where six select artists are paired with a poet to select a poem, which the artist then produced a limited edition run of broadsides. These broadsides would usually be offered to each attendee of the readings with the suggested donation. For this series, the production process was postponed due to the city's shutdown, so the artists will have them completed at a later date. We plan to host another event in the future to commemorate the release of these broadsides and we'll ship them to each person who donated to today's event. They'll also be available for pickup at the center for those who choose to pick up. This program would not be possible without the support of our funders. The New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and New York City Department of Cultural Affairs with the City Council. We'd also like to thank our members. We're currently in the midst of a membership drive with the goal of gaining 100 members by the end of the month. So please consider supporting the center with your membership. You can go to centerforbookarts.org slash support to learn more. We're so excited to have Benjamin Kruisling and Mayfield Brooks to share some work with us tonight. And a special thanks to Asya Wadud for her thoughtful curation and moderation of the series. Asya Wadud is the author of Crosslight for Young Bird, Day Pulls Down the Sky, A Filament in Gold Leaf, which was written collaboratively with Okwi Akpakwasili. She is also the author of Syncope and forthcoming No Knowledge is Complete Until It Passes Through My Body. Asya is a current resident at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and, an, and a writer in residence at Dance Project Platform. You can also find her work in Eflux Journal, Bomb Magazine, Social Text Journal, Fence, and elsewhere. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, where she teaches poetry at St. Anne's School. So now I welcome Asya Wadud. Hi, everyone. Jenna, thank you so very much um, for the warm welcome to everyone that's gathered here tonight. I'm just looking through the names, and it's so nice to see among you, um, so many friends and um, old friends and new friends. And even though we're not together in person tonight, somehow, um, I guess this is the next best thing to be together in this kind of um, new, newfound, newfangled room. So welcome to everyone who's here. Um, I just wanna say a couple things about the series. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you so very much to the Center for Book Arts for hosting us tonight and for Jenna to putting, for putting together all the, all the um, logistics for this evening and, um, and just gathering us all here. Um, so tonight marks the first of a series of three readings. Tonight we have Mayfield Brooks and Benjamin Kruisling. Um, tonight is May 14th. We're here at 6.30. In two weeks, 14 days, we will have another reading. Um, with two other artists and writers, Anna Gerton Wachter and Selena Stu. Um, that's May 28th, 6 30, same time, same place. And then on June 11th, we'll have the third of three readings, and that will be with Anais Duplan and uh, Zara Patterson, who will be sharing work. So please, I invite you cordially to come join us for, um, for the reading on May 28th, and then also the reading on June 11th. Okay, so just a little bit about um, a little bit about tonight and um, how, how things will work tonight. It's pretty straightforward. We will have two readings. 
as Jenna mentioned, the broadsides are going to be available sometime in the future. In the in the future, which at this point is hard to say what the future what the future means, but the broadsides will be available once um, once the artists have access to their studios again, and once things are a bit calmer and the crisis that we are in the middle of right now has passed a bit. Um, Nick Hay is uh, is the artist that is creating um, Ben's broadside and. They're creating a broadside for the piece um, that's entitled Friendship is Roughly Everywhere. Thanks, just a great title. Um, and Nick Kay is thinking about a lot of different things in terms of the broadside, but this idea of flux and movement and motion is kind of one of the guiding principles in thinking about how to, how to design the, the broadside. Um, and then Rachel Hillary, who's here tonight. Hi, Rachel, is working on Mayfield's broadside and um, Rachel's chosen the piece after Toni Morrison, and um, and one of the one of the many things that Rachel is thinking about is uh, is this idea of this kind of correspondence of a letter and a poster, and how posters how po how letters and posters kind of mirror each other in the sense that the letter that is sent or received or written is kind of this private. Um, version almost of a poster that's meant for this kind of public consumption and public eyes. Um, and then both both Nick and Rachel are also just thinking about the space, the space of a poem on a page and how to translate that space into the form of the broadside. Um, so you have that to look forward to um, in the future. So as for tonight, um, I'll just tell you a couple of things before we get started. Um, Benjamin will read first. And then Mayfield will read. I'm going to introduce both Ben and Mayfield right now. After Ben reads, each person will read for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, after Ben reads, there'll just be a short pause and then we'll, we'll continue. So there'll kind of just be a continuous reading um, from Benjamin straight to Mayfield. And then um, while they're reading, please feel free in the chat to send us any questions that you have. Any questions for Mayfield, questions for Ben, um, questions for the both of them. And then once we finish the reading, we'll have a Q&A and we'll try to get to um, as many questions as we can. Okay, so Benjamin Kruzling. It's a room with floor to ceiling mirrors and people spread their arms there to sing, to place the face at the center, to tell the world childhood is sweet though it tastes like power over though it tastes like pistachio. These are eyes I make the world so careful with. Long static, long talk. Well, you say you want a strong feeling, have one, or someone will think you're withholding. It's an excerpt from Ben's poem, To Heaven on a Mule. In writing about Ben's work, Simone White says, Ben's poems have magic and carry inside them an absolute or total will to precision and also an exhibition of shyness, which is looking away. They tremble therefore with an exactness that is so moving, so exciting." End quote. I also find this magic and quote, will to precision end quote, inside and through Ben's poems. I'm curious about the tenderness vested in Benjamin's work, the soft percussion of it the tenderness abutting the continuum, of, the continuum of public and private violences. I'm curious about the page and what Benjamin makes of it, his deliberations and decisions, his terms, his punctuation, and how in his poems, punctuation becomes a chance to animate an end. In this particular moment, time does what it always does, publicly and privately, and in those itinerantly public and private spaces. And now though, in this distended static moment, time does all this, though only now in higher relief, or maybe we can see it better. In a talk from 2018, Benjamin said, when you're doing anything at a high level, you're always hitting the edge of a limit. And I think for me, that's what, that's what always motivates me to try strategies, different strategies to get there in a sense. I think when you're in poetry too much, even the best poetry, it all sort of floats away without some way, without some other ways of anchoring yourself to the world and trying to understand the lived conditions of your life, end quote. This persistence of meeting an edge and then turning left 
or turning right or following the desire line characterizes Ben's work for me. Benjamin Cruising is the author of Glaring, which is forthcoming this year from Wendy Subway. And I have too much to hide an image text project about terror and streaming. So welcome to Benjamin. And Mayfield Brooks. February 15th, 2018. Dear Marcia, Mount Tremper, upstate New York, finally resting, bath in the morning, winter quiet, forgot to say happy Valentine's Day. What does it take to be loved anyway? What does it take to be loved anyway? This question closes this particular letter to Marcia that Mayfield wrote, but of course the question creates its own permeable, permeable opening too. What does it take to be loved anyway? This question is one of a series of open questions that form a kind of shroud around Mayfield's epistolary poems. Other questions are, quote, who are we without her? Who will mine our brilliant ghosts with care? What shall we do? What does it take to be loved anyway? A letter feels viscous because we await the reply. It is a charged exchange, this continued correspondence. In Mayfield's poems, the reply doesn't arrive in the sense that it's a letter written back, but in another way, it also does. It arrives in the sense that in the process of writing the letter, we give ourselves permission to ask new questions, to wait, to sit, to be patient, or to move, to improvise. And as Mayfield says, to quote sip tea, to sigh heavily and smile, and to wait to write. With each dear Marcia, dear Tony, a chain link is granted from the past to right now to the future, not always in that order, knotted and tangled. Mayfield Brooks improvises while black and is based in Brooklyn, New York, working as a movement-based performance artist, vocalist, urban farmer, writer, and wanderer. They study contemporary dance <clears throat> at the School for New Dance in Amsterdam, moving on center in Oakland, California, and hold an MFA in interdisciplinary performance from UC Davis and a master in performance studies from Northwestern University. Mayfield was a 2017 artist in residence at Movement and Research New York, a 2019 dance and process artist at the kitchen in New York and is currently an artist in residence at the Center for Performance Research in Abrams Art Center. Mayfield teaches urban farming courses at Farm School New York and teaches and performs dance and vocal improvisation nationally and internationally. Benjamin Cruzling and Mayfield Brooks are two artists who evoke a lush and velvet attention, an ability to both stay, remain and to stay moving a pendulum, an unhurried metronome, a pinprick, in love, in violence, in mourning. The passing time loops, folds, and fans, and ghosts us these days. Benjamin and Mayfield's writing stays alive, though, a breath imprinted there. So please join me from your home. Make yourself at home and welcome Ben. Hi. Um, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thank you to uh, Asya for inviting me to this and for that introduction. Um, I feel a bit civ-like, civish. Uh, things are flowing through me. But as I was saying before this, um, it's nice to have a chance to sort of come together, not only as a group, but I think to pull my thoughts together for an evening um, with that happening. So uh, excited to be here. I'm really happy to be reading with Mayfield. Um, thank you to Jenna and the Center for Book Arts as well for making this happen, for developing the broadsides, which as mentioned, will um, be put together later. Um, I think I always want to sort of, I mean, maybe related to what Asya was saying in the uh, introduction. Um, I think the temporality of writing poems sort of, you know, or I should say there are many different temporalities. And so some of what I'm reading tonight, you know, was written two, three years ago. Um, it's coming 
out in a book that I have called Glaring. Um, and so I'm always trying to think of ways to sort of activate those things again when I do choose to read them, um, to make them sort of relevant to, you know, where I am so that I can read them with conviction. So with that in mind, uh, I sort of have an opening set of remarks or kind of a poetry essay that's really sort of scattered points of interest that I'll read straight through and then read straight through the poems, I think, and uh, that should be it. I cover a page up. There was this gap between my experience of planes, my eating, my walk from the one train to bed. It's so embarrassing, a field of golden radishes and sprouts in the daytime just hustling, whistling. Then I was so pressed, I shook. How can you say your life belongs to you? People are praying more than ever before. I'm living a normal life in utter aloneness, fossil of aloneness from Don Lundy Martin. Not least to blame for the withering of experience is the fact that things under the law of pure functionality assume a form that limits contact with them to mere operation and tolerates no surplus, either in freedom of conduct or autonomy of things, which would survive as the core of experience because it is not consumed by the moment of action. From Adorno, from a piece partially about fascist aesthetics, let's say a keypad into which you punch numbers to open a door an app that summons food or transportation to your door, a door that doesn't creak or stick. Let's say under current conditions, a surplus which survives as experience is something some people are made to suffer from, a disproportionate experience of contracting and becoming ill with the novel coronavirus, for example. I've been so alone at home thinking about my chronic lung condition about surpluses and deficits, about withering and fecundity. My friend Yvonne said she couldn't decide if she was withering or blossoming, meaning headed toward more or less life. Meanwhile, my effective apparatus has been so scraped out by hypervigilance hyper and concern. I felt like I was on another planet, rubbing dishes down with a sponge, thinking of a sick friend listening to T. Zandos and Sticks, 140 beats per minute of UK drill. And these visions of death percolate, simmer. Then my personal life particulates, turns to fog. An acquaintance crying on Zoom joins the circuit of televisual content. So I write, what in my life has nothing to do with anyone else? When I open the window to sirens, send a mask or meal, when I sit down to collect and deliver the form of energy and language called a poem. In the mountains last year, I decided to write my first ever poem about nature. I said, I'm here, I'll write a poem about trees. Here's what I wrote. I hate when people be doing too much. We're in the brief growing season and blueberries are coming in a park protected by New York state law. Across the water, the mountain blues with pulling away. So I set out to write this poem about nature, but I think I was more interested in New York state law and a critique of sycophancy, not of excess, which I felt the need to clarify after including here. And I'm more interested in New York state law now as our state government presides over a pile of black and brown bodies and their approval ratings shoot up into the 80s. As our governor is organizing a gang of billionaires to gut what remains of public life in the name of expert approval. It all makes me sick. The poems I'm reading tonight come mainly from my forthcoming book, Glaring, as I said, along with some newer in-progress work, all written from and reacting to that particular sickness, a sickness I was worried would sediment and fossilize unless I called it by name. 
unless I found new ways of making what happens matter or new ways of making matter happen. <clears throat> Pleasure is stubborn in retrospect. First there's love, then there's synchronized time. Then there's troops barely secretly in Yemen, Niger, the pre-turnstile zone of the subway. That's happening also. There are people out in the sense that love can't be from them, can't be seen assuming any kind of grace. When you broke, you just feel abandoned, acrylic reds, yellows. I love you because you're on the other side of the room because steam comes off you in the twilight gone green with night vision. I fall asleep by three, wake up by nine because the cars go by so harshly. Then I think love is coming from me. Love is streaming from me. It's there, but there's no time. The artifact being thought the most beautiful thing. I thought I was near where Malcolm was shot. Then I realized I was wrong. We were blessed with these sensitivities, navigating a landscape that varies its networks of trouble, change over time. In fact, the building, which was not where I was, though I was near there, is decorated with terracotta, glazed polychromy, and crustaceans and cornices, gaudy colors in the Hellenic style. My face crushed against the wiki page on which I was reading this, collecting material for a treatment. I was there, having realized I was wrong in the memory of being somewhere else. Was I being spoken to, I wondered, not being the only voice possible in that area. The idea of violence from an old photograph, the setting of someone up is digital. Weaving these things through one another as habit and then intent because I was scared and without equipment, navigating that gaudily. Then that historical feeling Thinking one is where something happened that one is thinking about, then not being there, but feeling that. The world peopled as it is with hallucinations, justice being not among them, but thought of also. Experiencing conspiracy as a digital product, anxious, setting the scene while isolating the voice, people themselves being so small on the sidewalk people themselves dying so violently, the memory of that hanging, as at that moment, I was having my small, different experience, heading more slowly and apparently elsewhere. Being young after all, looking upwards, as I'm describing myself at that time, and crustaceans looming. Words seen in the sense of portals. The night makes compassion happen. In the sense of one narrow read of embitterment, wherein the amnesic field is bled by visual data, where 20 chains dance in the mirror. In the sense of the voice, as it were, hopping the discontinuous turnstile. As everyone knows, I'm in love. The mind is filled. So one sees space occur visually between two people. Space when there's none there is there. In the night where black makes matter happen, where het love is a freaky war machine and one psychosexual nightmare makes phantoms that stack sandpaper in the linen closet, as if the words could be seen doing that. There's no one here but you, pure present and always tense. It's night. 
No stars, 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 no stars. No stars, no stars, no stars, no stars, no stars, no stars. No stars, no starts, no stars, no sirens, 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 no sirens, 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 sirens. No sirens, 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 resin, sirens, no sirens, no sirens, no clothes, no clothes, no cloths, clothes, no clothes, no clothes, no clothes, no clothes. No clothes, no clothes, no clothes, no clothes, no family, 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 no night, 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 no. It contributes in a singularly emphatic way to the ideological function of art. Look such pleasure when a death, completely awash with cars moaning along. Look such a black happening. People have whole degrees of attachment error. Before I was so rudely run out of the bookstore, was going to say something was winding up to say something about the nerve and field of meaning of this anti-Black happening, its implications for life on earth. Sort of said it, sort of meant the cool afternoon and its brutal interests, something stuck in the trunk of the culture dispenser. And I'm returning the books to your shelves. I come here every day, you know, and I never find pleasure I don't want my life to disappear behind me. Let me tell you what goes through my brain on a day of spiritual crossing, on a day of bird song and psychic ambulance chasing. Let me tell you I'm cooked. I'm on a number of drugs. The pundit says, hello. Our brave air force is flying over Brooklyn to tell you good luck. I'm at home with asthma and blackout energy, letting my brain poison my body. Let me tell you what goes on when this man stops me while I'm putting trash in bins. Says, let me get that litter box, but it isn't mine and it's full of garbage. He says, let me get that dime, but I can't find it. Right there, he says, but it isn't. I can't pick it up and give it to him. Then he starts screaming down the block a bit joyously to my ear with my ear unlocked. We're not separate at all, but that's why lyric fails. What reasonable person will believe it? I can't say both things at once without saying both things separately. His scream is not my scream. I put the trash in the bins because I have a friend to answer to. My time is full of never knowing, but when I hear good music, I say, that's so good. I say, they did that. I pull something human off my face. My heart now would have outrun speech. We read books for the people. Furthermore, I was walking downtown in disbelief. I went upstate in disbelief. Extra judicial killing, judicial killing, financial stress were all spread out and ungathered. Images of my father's anger kept arising, but I read about film transfer and filled with joy. This heat kept rising. The orange wildflower bloomed and cut to black as power faded. The sky was rich with blues and grays, dense sexually. I hate manners, love the idea of solar power. 
White power sneezed all this onto a screen and the work is to create possibilities for new media. All a bit dry right now, but that's living too. While I'm struggling to know what I want from people and the sunlight is grazing the tops of the trees on the lawn. Slowly, my black mood came crawling. Politics is what someone does. But talking to them, I was like, maybe these are pre-disaster pieces when the surpassing disaster is here and ongoing. I couldn't read anything more about quiet observation in domestic space or let shame cling to me. How evil I'd felt I'd been with my lean death tease in that concrete depression loft with every evidence of living available on the floor, with the dust in the air just sparkling, glistening. And I saw myself in bed, a hot dead object. What else can this work be besides notes on programmed item shimmer? Like for example, the clouds were heavy, still and sad all stupid expected aggression. The ABC7 helicopter chewed the afternoon's illusion of privacy up and still I had to eat soup dumplings, fix my acid reflux, meet Catherine for a drink, tell Catherine goodbye, tell the world goodbye or earn today's money and act. My life cracks slowly, subcritically like a flag like a back. Friendship is roughly everywhere, thanks. The uniform person puts traffic cones down in neat rows. They're bright orange, weeping. What's next is, I'm happy for your jazz concern. It's all sexual. And if I pushed it clear, we'd still be on the street, right inside the boundary. I'm so happy there's nothing going on. Soretta was right about winning, full of information, none glowing, synthetic color in the limbic motor. It's just people look so good when you trust them and you don't look. To heaven on a mule. Spurious, Helen Johnson. My dream of heaven was an ice cream factory, but it echoed blackface heaven from a few minutes earlier. And all wishes, brained on the marvel of televised limbo, where production assistants line up lights and vanish, drag social pain into procedures that taste great on camera. People, in that sense, Reviewing memory produces artifacts, long static renditions of blackface, heaven. So they try to shred the bush ears with vocal runs. It's a room with floor to ceiling mirrors and people spread their arms there to sing, to place the face at the center, to tell the world childhood is sweet, though it tastes like power over, though it tastes like pistachio. These are eyes I make the world so careful with long static, long talk, well, you say you want a strong feeling, have one, or someone will think you're withholding. It's like fed logic, depression fighting escapism. Childhood is so sweet, they say, as they go house to house killing on a thick recursive loop. And their faces drip, they're wet with effort. Okay, I think I'll read two more poems. Um, this is a self-portrait that I wrote uh, recently. <laughs> I opened the door with a welcoming action, a self-portrait. Now, as I live my life in service of becoming so present, RIP Pop Smoke, Grandma Gloria, Linda, 
literally memory now, plastic ocean, self-medicate, clouds, break up, black horizon, as the block end swarms with men fixing the roof of the key foods. I'm fixated on it, weeping on mushrooms, reclaiming the subways, all open and running in the visual world. I watch the police insert a person's body into a bag and into a van, 16 or so of us watching, little shock of life. Sure, I'm almost 30. My eyes worsen as I see myself seeing. From Corona Cop. It's actually not on the nose because I'm not thinking at all. It's not on the ball because again, I'm not thinking a thing. I had a need to love clearly. I think my father ate his life up through it. I read this interview about the language of organ tuning and harmonic expressions that have been disappeared from the Western music historical memory. There were different tunings for different villages, tunings for the church, the castle, different cultures of feeling. I have an abject fear of conscription and have embraced various raw fibers in my making to avoid feeling like McDonald's. Reality comes roaring off my body in these great gray waves, whatever, of ghosted jobs. I'm not self-satisfied or grateful for my minor good fortune, which implies questions of desert and sacrifice. I'm trying to elaborate this idea of vulnerability in my relationships that deprioritizes the transcendence of fear and ugliness, but I might be wrong about it. The voice being so naked in song and desire. I don't have my priorities in order. I feel I have a lot of fear and ugliness to transcend. I miss my friend, she's gone away, even though she lives in Flatbush. Someone utterly screams outside my window. Today I saw my body in the mirror and tears came. I was so grateful for life. My pupils were so wide. My heart was so full of worms. Then it wasn't, I'm sure it isn't. A day of recording my saying hello to myself. Self-medicate, drone, escutcheon of fortitude. I think what I want to say is not in the words area. It comes from earlier on my fear of the body I didn't know I had. I get older. I think I'm feeling, mom, what you must have felt. Okay, this is the last one. Let life be ashamed of lasting so long for me, but I found a way to say no to it. Stop by so broadly a man today and in the small way of nervous people and the clear cutting of the grass, which he does and keeps bugs away and colors the air with distortion. I was bristling with distraction, pure intention, perfect taste and which trouble to avoid. These are the things of the world, my feet and hands, the face of my mother. And these are the peonies, incendiaries and spikes. I'm drinking water out of plastic. I'm draining my mind into pictures of people brutalized in the informational flows of 21st century culture ways. This man screaming at me or himself with a gun in his hand. That's why I said we're finished with love for now. I said it, but I don't believe it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, we will move straight away into Mayfield's reading. Hi, Mayfield. Hi, Asia. Thanks for curating us. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. That was beautiful. Um, I kind of have two sets of poems and uh, I had I started writing these Toni Morrison poems on the subway before I had stopped going on the subway because of the coronavirus. Um, and so I turned those into poems and then 
<clears throat> I've been writing Marsha P. Johnson um, poems or letters for um, about four years now. I'm gonna book in the reading with actual letters and then gonna read the poems um, for this reading. And I just wanted to share a picture of Toni Morrison honoring her as a, a recent ancestor and also uh, one of Marsha. And I, I can't forget Nina Simone. <laughs> these, I, I have these around me all the time. Dear Marcia, the last phone conversation I had with my dad felt normal, but heartbreaking. There is a clear communication that happens. We speak to each other and it feels normal, but it's off in the most surreal way. It's like we have this language underneath the actual spoken language. He knows that he is losing his memory, but because the memory is dissolving, he also doesn't know. Maybe this is what I am trying to reach for with the memory of my third birthday or with the laughter or with being in the imaginary garden of this piece today that I am not titling because I don't really have words for this type of embodied memory excavation. It's an unknown territory, forever unreachable, and I am flailing. I am failing. I am falling into the unknown. Two dads, one gone since I was six, and now the other is slowly going too. Nothing to grasp like sand falling through the hands of a child. I realized that the photo of my birth dad and I singing in the salt and pepper shakers on the cover of the birthday zine is not really a memory it's an imprint. Are we all just imprints of some kind of imaginary existence? Thank you for listening. Love, Mayfield. After Toni Morrison, Truth seekers be damned. What shall we do? Integrity interrupted. Who are we without her? Her aftermath arise in the wake of her gargantuan accomplishment, centering black thought, quietly kept. Who will mine our brilliant ghosts with care? Toni Morrison's cat. Toni Morrison's cat sits in her lap each morning as she sips tea, watches the sunrise, waits to write, sighs heavily and smiles at the sky before the light comes bursting upon the horizon, scorching her sense of spirit into being all the words, all the words, all the questions that she needed to ask. Toni Morrison's cat was there for it all, sitting quietly the way cats do, slate gray fur, rough tongue, soft belly, full of love for a woman no one knows, a woman shrouded in elegant words, unmatched in skill and precision, a woman, a believer, born on the cusp of revolutions.
Toni Morrison's Christmas tree. Tree planting happens in fall before the frost, after the summer heat. So she decided to plant her tree on the fall equinox because she could groove to the sound of autumn, a word full of reverence like when the ballet ends or church begins, she knew about beginnings and endings, heartbreak and love. So she planted her Christmas tree early at sunrise, moments before the sky became baby blue with a slight shimmer of light, moments before she would pick up her pen to gather stories of the ones who came before. She took a shovel and dug a hole, placed the rootstock there, covered it with dirt and calmly lit a cigarette while watching the sun rise on a new day. Proud of her efforts, aware of this tree and how she would light it year after year until her own light went out. Miss Morrison, I think you would understand. I think you would understand the compulsion to write them. They come to you with so much information. They need you and you need them to make sense of life after life. There is no dying, only life after life, only the telephone that always works, soul telephones living in roots, rivers and trees from another time sophisticated trickster spiders, elegant ants and dancing bees listening in. I think you would understand the compulsion to write them. They get your attention in the most unconventional ways, an overturned canoe or a microwave that explodes, broken glass, an unexpected breeze. They know what they know. We know that they know, but we forget to feed them. We forget to pay attention. But I think you understood that most of us forgot. So you listened for us. You paid attention. You fed them and gave us their stories. This next poem is also a Toni Morrison poem, but it's a it's 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 to a character in her book Sula. So the poem um, is about Sula, who is the main character of the book Sula. Hello, Sula. I always wondered why Miss Morrison wrote you into being like a syncopated note or a jazz dance split. You were work, you were wounded. You were what we might call woke. Your story, a slim novella akin to sheet music, a fugue per se. Miss Morrison molded you from clay, burned you into being, gave you lips, long legs and a good complexion. But you went rogue, ran off the page, never came back to the novel. It was to be expected. You were free, black and dangerous. Tony Morrison's house. I wrote this one today, <laughs> or I finished it today. Tony Morrison's house. Before the house burned down, before the house, before the house burned down, before the house, Tony Morrison's house burned down, before the house, before the house burned down, before the house, Tony Morrison's house burned down. 
before the house, before the house burned down, before the house, Odetta sang house of the rising sun, before the house burned down, before the house, Nina Simone sang house of the rising sun, before the house burned down, before the house, Nina and Odetta whispered into Toni Morrison's ear, before the house burned down, the house was the south. Before the South burned down, before the South, before the South burned down, Toni Morrison's house burned down. In an interview, she said, I mourned a couple of things. First of all, I spent a lot of time being happy that my son was not hurt. The second thing was I lost his and his brother's report cards, which I will never get back. The third thing was I had a pot of a jade bush that was about 15 years old and it was huge and beautiful and it burnt in a snap. Of course, I lost manuscripts <laughs> and books and some other things, but the hurt was the report cards and the hurt was the jade bush. Toni Morrison's house burned down before the house, before the house burned down, before the house. going to transition to the letters to Marsha poems. And um, there's a quote that she said um, that I'll just recite here. I'm dying, 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 but I'm not dead yet. Marsha Pay at No Mind Johnson. April 6, 2019. Dear Marcia, if death is rest, so be it. This is not a memorial. I won't cry. Simply succumb to a vulnerable demise rife with fungi, closer to dirt. March 13, 2018. Dear Marcia, it was a job in Chelsea, cleaning toilets. One of those on-call jobs. And there was a mouse problem. After handling it and leaving the apartment my body broke down, crying on the steps of a Montessori school. I remember the red door. This was the first time you came to me, a benevolent ghost who somehow managed to soothe my tears. When they found you in the Hudson River near the Chelsea Piers, you were 46. The date, July 6th. 1992. Wanarovich and Lord had already passed on. AIDS and cancer took them away that year. But we, Marsha, you and I, we had a missed connection. I was there in 92. Twenty-four years fast forward, after the mouse, after the red door, you found me. I was 46 years old, the same age you were when they found your body in the Hudson. We had a missed connection, now found. 
Like tears and rain, said Roy to the Blade Runner. Like tears and rain, I say to you. May 16th, 2019. Dear Marcia, at the end of the day, at the end of a life, there are many birthdays, some sweet, some unwanted, many forgotten. Oh, the terror of childhood. Oh, the joy of aging. From day one to day 17,520, an absurd number and a filthy, glorious life. March 2nd, 2018. Dear Marcia, winter's last gasp, New York City snow, stalled activity, elemental life, San Francisco fog, ocean salt, sweet air, did you know the ocean would take you? Maybe the Atlantic is where we all must go. So many souls already waiting amidst the watery archive. Our only place of mooring, the Black Atlantic, forever home. April 6, 2019. Dear Marcia, I wrote this soliloquy for the audience. There were limited viewings of six people at a time who came to see me ensconced in compost, dirt, and decaying flowers for an installation honoring you and Julius Eastman. My body was covered in over 40 pounds of decaying organic matter atop a conference table. The event was a wake of sorts, a prologue to my dance piece, Entropy's Garden, that I later performed as Letters to Marcia to you. I laid under the dirt for two hours. I will do it again in October and people were escorted in to witness my naked body under all that dirt for 15 minutes at a time in eight installments after they heard my recorded voice speak the following message. From the one who you are about to witness who has given up the ghost, I am not asking you to see me Sit, sip tea, or do whatever you need to do to prepare yourself for the viewing hours. I am asking you to be a witness. Can I get a witness? I am asking you to take your pulse by pressing two fingers, the fingers to the left of your thumb on your left hand against a small cavity of flesh behind and possibly slightly above your left ear lobe, I am asking you to find your pulse. Are you alive? Are you a witness of your life in this moment? Thank your lucky stars that you are alive in this moment and that you have this opportunity to recognize your own life. I am not asking you to see me because the world has not prepared you to see me. Witness what you think you are seeing. Do not try to see me. Do not try to look too hard. After the viewing hours, 
I would like you to commit to a practice of witnessing what you see, what you don't see, and what you cannot see. In other words, observe yourself seeing. You are responsible from this moment forth to commit yourself to this practice as a move towards reparations. And as you know, repair work takes centuries. You and I will not live to see the repair work completed, but you can still be a witness. Witnessing is not everything, but it counts. The world that does not allow you to see me must end. Hopefully, you will aid in the process of ending that world. That would be repair work. Thank you for being here to witness this moment, even though this world may not allow you to see me. I am thankful that you are here from the bottom of my heart. Caveat, if you do see me, really see me, you have most likely experienced anti-Black violence against your body, psyche, and ancestors. You know what anti-Black violence is, and you know why I have given up the ghost at this particular moment in time. You know how dangerous it is to be alive, so you are not just a witness. You need your own viewing hours, and I invite you to sit with me. Hold my hand if you need to, and I will hold yours while we both give up the ghost. You and your ancestors were and are supposed to get reparations, but this world has not been accountable to you or them. This world needs to be destroyed so the repair work can begin. Can I get a witness? You deserve to be seen too. I will see you on the other side. Thank you for being here from the bottom of my heart. Um, I'm gonna read two more and get a little bit more light. October 13, 2018. Dear Marcia, these hauntings happen everywhere. Hauntings happen every here, happened where? Ever here, this up here. Shh, never there. And this is the last letter. I perform this um, in a performance, so it's, it's more performative. December 29th, 2019. Dear Marcia, I finally figured it out what this is what this process, this performance, what this connection between you and I, living and dead, it's like. I've been writing to you, it's like since I've been writing to you, something actually came alive in me. How is that possible? How is it possible for something to come alive in a person when they are already alive? Or in the converse, how is it possible for something to be dead in a person when they are alive? If I was completely honest with myself, there are things dying inside of me all the time. And then at the same time, there are things sprouting, budding, then exploding into life. How is it possible that all of that can happen at once beyond the fucking binary of life and death, but all at the same time? How is it possible that all of that can happen at once beyond the fucking binary of life and death, but all at the same time? I think it's a labor of love. Like in the book of Ruth, in the Bible, when Ruth decides to stay with Naomi after her husband dies, and it's this new life for her, but 
People find ways to live. You found a way. I'm finding a way. It's a labor of love. It's like the compost or watching the flames and the fire and the beauty of the burning wood or the steam rising from the compost on a cold morning. It's breaking down and it's a labor of love. It's giving something. It's working in order to give something that is transformed. Marsha, I've been so lonely, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but living in New York City is lonely. When you came to me in Chelsea on the steps of that Montessori school with the red door, I just broke down crying. Maybe I'm making it all up. Maybe I am, but that was the turning point for me. And soon after I started writing you letters, you were my Naomi and I your Ruth. Ruth said to Naomi, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus and more may the Lord do to me if anything but death parts me from you. It's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. Your life was a labor of love and you were a warrior. You were a warrior queen, but I lost you. Love lost, I lost myself. Thank you for listening. Love Mayfield. Thank you, Mayfield. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so um, hi, everyone. Uh, we are gonna have, we have a bit of time um, for some questions, uh, questions for Mayfield and questions for Ben. So um, I have a few questions of my own, but if you have questions that you would like to ask, you can use the chat window to ask them. So meanwhile, in the meantime, um, I'll start us off with a couple of questions and then um, you can send your own questions anytime. Um, I have to read my questions because unfortunately my mind is um, broken. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's like a hula hoop. You know how a hula hoop has that huge void in the middle and also at the same time it's spinning. So it's like that. So I'm going to, um, I'll start off. I see a few questions popping up. Um, so uh, this question I have, um, I'm wondering if both of you could say something about um, your writing practice as it relates to your other artistic and creative practices, video, performance, music. And I'm wondering where it rests um, with the writing. Is it adjacent? Is it in tandem? Is it some sort of ghost, ancestor, something else altogether. Um, I can start, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've always found that to be really important to, to my practice. I think my first, when I was in high school, I was like, I'm gonna play music in life. That's who I am and that's what I'm gonna do. And then I didn't quite have the discipline really, I'll say and some other stuff come up, so that didn't really happen. But I think I'm still a very deep listener. And, you know, I worked with sound and did that for a number of years. Um, and so I had this experience. I took a film class and I was using Premiere to edit uh, this experimental film I made. And someone made the comment that the way I was using this um, digital audio or this digital workstation was sort of like playing an instrument, which I think is my sort of experience like using digital workstations um, and seeing sort of timelines of uh, audio and uh, events and media kind of happen on a screen in ways that are rearrangeable uh, has been really influential to me um, as well as kind of deep listening to different kinds of um, black electronic music, uh, the ways that looping and sampling and, um, you know, uh, Digi digitally manufactured repetition. I liked what you said in the introduction, Asya, about um, like a soft percussion in my work. 
something like that, I think, because uh, I think that kind of sense of patterning um, or that kind of sonic quality is something that uh, happens at the same level as, you know, selecting words when I'm composing uh, a poem. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've always had this feeling that these things are like quite related and uh, I've had disagreements about that with people, but my feeling is that you use different tools to kind of express a similar set of ideas or collect a similar set of problems. Um, plus just writing poetry can stress me out, I think, because that's sort of the center of my work and it can create pressure to be doing it in a way that's exciting and enlivening. And when that's not happening, I need space to continue thinking, but somewhere else. And in those moments, I turn to, to sound and video, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> I'll be brief, but um, for me, the poems are, it, it's interesting to, to kind of work with the letters and then trans and then like I was on this whole kind of obsession to turn the po letters into poems <laughs> and then I realized that some of the letters were already poems so I didn't have to do that and then so there's this thing of like um there's all these drafts that I'm I feel like I work with um which is kind of fun um and then there's there's some of them are like written you know like a link like a letter but then others are typed up like poems um and i use them in performance some of them like this letter was part of a performance that's why it has gold on it because <laughs> it was like hanging in the space and so i feel like they're ob they're actual objects sometimes but I'll, and then but other times because I, I was like a poetry major when I was an undergrad in, in college and I kind of abandoned that for, I guess, movement, dance and more performative, and the more, more performative arts. But I think that there's, the reason I call it epistolary poetics because I feel like the letters brought me back to the poetry in a way, but there's, they kind of revolve around each other, so. The Toni Morrison project was so awesome because it was kind of like, for some reason being on, I needed to do stuff on the subway and those poems started coming on the subway to me. So those feel special to me in a different way in that they were more of a, it was like after she died. So it was after, I was wondering, yeah. Right after she died. And um, yeah, so it kind of like, those are, those are special to me because they kind of came out of a different place. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple questions. Uh, one question for both of you um, from Anna. I'm wondering if both Mayfield and Ben can give us an idea of what the poems look like on the page. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Both of you or either, either one of you? What your work looks like on the page and what that, how, how you make meaning of the page? What you think about in terms of the left mar the left margin and the center and the right and the holes if they're holes and the lines. Yeah. Um, well, I'm in a weird moment because I think in in my sorry I sort of have two projects that are about to be kind of released in a wider way like my book and this longer text image piece for Triple Canopy called I Have Too Much to Hide. And that piece in particular, um, the original idea, which we're altering a bit, was to have the text proceed in a kind of algorithmic way. And so I think, you know, one thing I do in a lot of my work is I have a gap between words and punctuation. So the comma won't touch the end of the word. The end of the word, there will be a space. Uh, same with exclamation points and things like that. Um, I think it creates a little more room for someone to not feel coerced into feeling what I'm feeling, um, you know, lets you think what's happening there and sort of sit with it on your own terms is my feeling because I do resent uh, coercion. Um, but I think I'm also thinking a lot about 
I think being on computers so much words have this kind of in punctuation, they all have this kind of particulate quality to me. Um, these things that are like detachable and rearrangeable. Uh, and so I guess I'd like to build that space in. Um, as it relates to the left margin, I think I used to be, that felt like a conformity to stay there, but increasingly I think I like to not think about that um, because it is just, I've decided to make it not a problem. I would say that. So my work is now almost completely on the left margin as of this year, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. That's interesting relationship between a problem and how a problem becomes not a problem. I yeah. mean, maybe that goes for so many things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Left margin and otherwise. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that. Uh, I love the space. I love the the vision of the space of the between the punctuation and the words. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm always revising, so I'm never done with revision. So like, I usually go from left to right, but then I'll like today I started uh, revising on top of a PDF, and that was really fun. Uh, so I had to put all of the letters in boxes, <laughs> all of the words in boxes, and then put them over or strike through uh, one of the Marcia letter poems. And I was like, oh, this is a really great way to revise and also for it to look different than just writing from the computer um, or even writing by hand. And yeah, I think that I'm, I'm in a con, because my work is so much about improvisation, I feel like I'm in a constant state of revision with all of it. And it gets awkward. And so I'm, I feel awkward <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a writer, as a poet, because I never, I never finish. And then when it is finished, I'm like, no, that's not finished. Yeah, so there's something about, for me, about like the awkwardness of the, the word on the page versus the word as spoken or the word as imagined or, I don't know if that answered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like that also because, I mean, I feel like that's an important thing for me that I hadn't thought about much until now, which is that in as many ways as word processing and computers make certain things easier, they're actually quite awkward uh, <laughs> when you're doing certain things. Example, like things are kind of stuck to lines in ways that don't happen in your journal necessarily. Um, and like you said, when you're going between platforms, how things kind of break. Yeah, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mayfield, was that intentional, the um, revising over the PDF, or was that like uh, a function of necessity, or how did that come about today? I think I just I started kind of. Um, reviewing the poems that I were that I had decided to read today and then I was reading them on the PDF and I wanted to make some revisions. So it kind of came by it kind of came as a, a bit of a mistake because I was I wasn't thinking going into it that I would make revisions but then I was like wait like there's some stuff here that needs to be tweaked. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, ben, I wanted to ask you about the coercion and the um, the space at the end of the space between the last word um, and the whatever the ending punctuation is. When you're when you're reading a piece that looks like that, is there a way for you to mark the difference in your own mind or when it's read of a, of a, a line that has a word? and then ending punctuation versus the last word, a space, and then the punctuation? Is there a difference in your mind or how it's read? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure that it comes through in the reading. I think for myself, it's maybe certain degrees of uh, softness or hardness in terms of breath and in terms of when the next line gets picked up or the next sort of unit of speech. Um, and what I do like about that space is that it softens or it gives me options in a way. Um, 
because when I see sort of a period right there, or a comma right there, it makes me have a particular kind of pause. Um, like many things, I think things become like lost in your personal obsessions. And so for me, there's like certainly a logic to it, but this is a problem, especially now I've been working with editors a lot for things that are sort of in between poetry and prose and things like that. And they always want to edit those things out. Or like when I, the way I write is sort of inconsistent in terms of capitalization as well. And sometimes when it makes it to publication, I'll permit it to be smoothed out depending on how I'm feeling that day. But I think that question of improvisation just applies to every aspect of my process. Like when I read and the day I publish something and just sort of depends what feels right to me at that time, which might not feel right another time. Um, and so I like to build flexibility into the work so that like, for example, today, there were lines I didn't read in the poems I wrote, um, but they're composed in such a way that I can, like, I know when I can take that out, if that's not something I'm, I'm feeling, like, I build that space in. And when I read for readings as well, I sort of make a script for performance. So a poem might appear one way in its published form, but when I put it into the page or document that I'm going to read from for something like this, um, I'll recompose it in a way that, you know, gives me permission to change it as I see fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, let's see. There are a few more questions. Um, question. Um, well, one question is, um, where can I read these poems? Where, where, where can people find your work? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, go, ben. <laughs> yeah, I could go. Uh, follow me on Instagram. I don't post work there, but I do post when I am going to release work, so you can see that. Um, but yeah, I have my, my book Glaring is coming out from Wendy Subway. Uh, I think in June, like everything, it sort of uh, depends on the publisher, and it's a weird moment of things not getting postponed, so we'll see, but uh, that should happen. And that's a lot of what I read tonight. Um, June is soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's that's probably the main thing. I have some some poems online. I have a website, which is my name. That's your name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Mayfield. I am working on my website. <laughs> actually, I was working on it today, and um, I'm, I actually write a lot of my poems in zines. So um, whenever I perform, I write zine, a zine usually, and it has some of the poems and the letters. So those will be up on my website probably by June. The website will be done. Um, and my Instagram too. Uh, I usually make announcements about when I'm performing or whenever anything's happening. Uh, yeah. That's great. Oh, my guys, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Would you guys mind uh, put their questions about? Okay, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, would you mind posting your Instagram and website, Ben? Benjamin, I just posted yours since I have it handy. Um, great. Uh, it's almost eight. It's seven fifty-eight, which means it's two minutes before eight. Let me just see if there's one last uh, quick question. Um, there's a question. This is a nice way to end, I think. Um, this question, what inspires you both to write about something? Like, how, how do you know that it's something that you want to write about? Especially given that you have other ways of, like other, other ways to enter something. How do you decide that, uh, that you want to write about something? Or do you decide? If you had, you want to start? Yeah, I I feel that like with the whole Marsha thing, what was so kind of serendipitous about it was that the year that I turned 46, I was in that situation in the poem where I was kind of breaking down and I was literally like probably a block or two away from 
where she, they found her body. And that year she was also 46, that was 92. And I felt like there was some kind of convergence, you know, um, kind of when something comes to you in a time of need. And so I felt, I definitely felt that on a kind of a spiritual level with the Marsha letters. And then I realized later that, I don't know, there was something about this particular year, um, 2016, I had left a PhD program. So it was kind of a big, <laughs> a big year. Um, yeah, I don't know, convergence, serendipity. I don't feel like I decide as much as I am just trying to listen and things come up, you know, and I, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I try to be available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like availability. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this question gets answered in different ways for me in my own sort of running narrative. But I feel like sort of, you know, I kind of suffered quite a bit as a youth and kept a lot inside. And then, you know, it had to go somewhere. And so that was why I initially wrote. And I think the older I get and the more writing has become sort of a professional thing that is at the center of my life in terms of, you know, I'll go somewhere to do this and it's related to writing or, you know, this is taking my time and it's related to my work that is writing. Um, I always have to ask myself that question again, like, why am I doing it? And I think, you know, it's like, I saw that my personal suffering was, you know, as I learned about life was a political issue and uh, my suffering didn't necessarily belong to me in that way. Um, and that many other people suffered as well. And the goal is for us to not suffer that way. So I think still to this day, you know, those are the feelings that kind of produce the energy that leads to a poem. Um, that kind of acute feeling of suffering happening um, and not mine necessarily, but yeah, injustice, things like that. That's the broad answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just, I also wanted to say yeah, I, I specifically write for performance too. So there's, there's, a, there's definitely an intentionality around that. And um, so for example, with the, the, the soliloquy about, uh, can I get a witness? That was written to, in conjunction with the installation, you know, where I buried myself in compost. And um, the zine was actually in the format of like a, you know, like a, a funeral prayer card. So yeah, it all, it all kind of worked together as, as like, a, also like objects, you know, it, it was also, this is a zine, it's like, mm -hmm own little object. So I feel like I write for, to, to produce, to create objects too sometimes. <laughs> Maybe objects of mourning, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, objects of mourning. Um, so it is, it is indeed eight, but I thought um, people who are gathered um, and Mayfield and Ben, I wonder, as a closing, um, if you can just tell us the title of something recently or not even recently, maybe just something from this moment that you've read or have seen or listened to or overheard that um, you want to pass on to other people. And people who are gathered, if you have um, something similarly that you have read or seen or listened to or overheard, you can put it in the chat and I'll compile everything and try and share it with you. Um, I was listening to this Nina Simone song from her album Emergency Ward called uh, Today is a Killer, mm -hmm. um, which 
she's interpolating from a last poet's uh, poem song called Today is a Killer. Um, and she kind of throws it in the middle of another song that she's doing. And it's just the most, I mean, I keep listening to it. I'm obsessed with this, you know, 14 minute uh, live recording. Um, yeah. Today is a killer. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, that relates to what I've been reading. Um, I've been reading Afro Pessimism by Frank Wilderson. And I'm laughing, I'm crying, I'm bookmarking. It's, it's an incredible, incredible kind of memoir slash critical theory instruction manual. <laughs> um, and I highly, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a really good read. Thanks for sharing. And, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, there are a few ideas from the chat as well. Thanks for sharing everyone. Um, everyone, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us tonight, for being here and, um, and for sharing this time with us. Um, and thank you, Ben, and thank you, Mayfield, and Jenna, and Center for the Book Arts for gathering all of us. Um, Please come back in exactly 14 days, two weeks from now, from now for Anna Gerton Wachter and Selena Sue, and then later uh, June 11th for um, Anais Dupan and Zara Patterson. We'll see you soon. Good night. Bye. Bye.